Sharon here from My Crafty Greetings and we're doing a Scrappy Tales video and there is a sale on right now, 17% off if you use the code there. I'll put it in the drop down box below. You've got till tomorrow night because this is the 16th to do that. So I just wanted to uh, do a video using this stamp set. I know I don't color very often and uh, yeah, I decided to color. <laughs> so, and after having a somewhat not great weekend, I came home to find my Goosefer, Mr. Peeps, our rescue gosling, standing on two stumps of wood looking at like the king of the kingdom here. So that put a smile on my face and I thought maybe might, you might like to see him and his lady goose there. So I am just adding some darker uh, bits to the rim now. I am not... I have not had any courses in coloring with markers. I am not anyone special when it comes to coloring with markers. I tend to approach coloring with markers just like you would if you were painting with watercolors, which I'm no expert at either. <laughs> but I just, you know, kind of look at it and say, okay, let's uh, let's pick the 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 light spots and add some darker parts to them and uh, then do what we can to fill in the picture and a spoon was a challenge that I was up for as well as a smug. Now I'm going to take these two grays they're not from the same color line of grays but I'm going to do them tip to tip anyways and when you own the markers you do whatever you want with them. I liked this because I always find that it has more of a kind of darker steel gray look in the bottom of the spoon than the outside that has that bright kind of metallic shiny almost a bluey white look and so that's why I'm just picking up a tiny bit of that uh, darker steely gray look and I just tap it into the areas that would look a little bit darker on a spoon. Now I use Nina Solar White 80 pound and it bled so I'm cleaning it up with my white pen and now that I've got it out I'm doing my highlights which, you know, the edges of a spoon are where you need the highlights. And I had fun doing this. And then once I got going, I started getting a little bit carried away. I put white all the way around the rim of the cup. And then I started dotting little dots in for the froth. And once I got going, I had white marks on everything. <laughs> I am no expert at the white mark thing, but yeah, I went a little crazy. Now this I was kind of proud of. I pulled out a trio of turquoise markers and I just went for it and gave it a color in in the lightest turquoise color that I had. <laughs> and one of the things I noticed about some of the lighter colors, if you start playing around with your markers, is that when you layer the light colored ones over each other when they've dried, they'll actually make darker sections. So I use that to my advantage. And... I have this mid-tone um, turquoise here and you can see where I didn't quite color up to the lip of the mug and that's to just allow there to be a bit of a highlight and I found that the mid-tone marker as well as it dried if I went back over it it went ahead and uh, intensified the color the areas where I wanted to blend the color I went ahead and used my lightest marker and just like I would with a uh, watercolor I went over top of it with the light one and was able to just kind of smear that in blend it in and have it all go together now I imagine that if I had used a Nina 110 pound or 100 pound paperweight this would have been much better <laughs> but uh, it didn't turn out too badly you can see in the wet ink there I'm just adding in the BT7 and uh, I went over that center portion a little bit more just to give it a little bit more blending and once this dries it actually looks pretty cool now I find with the spectrum noirs they're a little bit more streaky but I do like the little pointed tips the bullet tips I guess they're called they're a lot easier to work with than the Copics because I have Copics in Canada and Spectrum Noirs in the US. Um, the color families are quite a bit different, but you know what? If you just use your colors and don't worry about it, you will have no problem uh, getting all of these, these colors to color your stuff in and make it work. All of it is practice and being brave enough to experiment try coloring a regular royal blue and going over it with a light teal and then a medium teal this is how i lay out all my colors too i just use my cutoffs from when i'm i'm doing my card bases and uh, that helps me pick out the colors that i want 
So uh, I put in a couple more little dark spots around the cookies and at the back part of the mug on the uh, saucer that's under there and it kind of looks like there's a ring and the saucer's floating <laughs> or not even a saucer. It looks like it's just a ring beneath the mug. So once we get this blended here, I'm going to take a little bit of that gray again and uh, just put the tiniest amount underneath and you'll see how that grounds that mug into the saucer. All of a sudden now it looks like the cookies and the mug are part of that saucer. That's all it needed. Just a little tiny hint of gray and you know you don't need to work yourself into a knot over that. Cookies are pretty easy to color. This is why I really really like this stamp set. It's big images. I have big hands. Those are big images. I have a hard time coloring those little tiny ones and Sabrina does make all of all of her die cuts and all of her stamps uh, bigger than what you would find on your average stamp or die sets so that they're easier to work with and I find them more fun to use, especially so making five by seven cards. Okay, I made this takeout mug too and I thought that it turned particularly awesome. I love this chartreuse green and I had a, a little bit of a modus operandi in there that uh, I wanted to pull in some other fun things when we made this into a card because of course the whole point of you watching me color is so we can get to the awesome technique that I'm going to show you because you know it's going to be crazy because my coloring's not crazy well it's a little nuts but it's not crazy <laughs> <laughs> so I did really like too how I did this kind of part here. I used the chiseled uh, nib to color this in. I have no idea why I did it other than it was a big rectangular shape, but I took the chiseled nib out and I stuck with it. And again, here we go where I took advantage of the fact that the center portion stayed lighter. It's, uh, I went over that quickly and then where I went back and forth over the other areas trying to be careful, it just made a darker outside and it looked kind of neat, so I kept it. Now I have a slightly darker brown here and all I'm doing is just doing a very jagged, sketchy line along those ribs so that they have a shadow. And this is all stuff that as you play with your markers and as you try and use your supplies, you, like me, will learn how to use them and have them make beautiful things. People that are here on YouTube aren't able to do this stuff just by grabbing a marker and starting out the gate. They spend all kinds of time practicing and there's tons of projects that didn't make it that we never get to see. And, you know, I try and show you some. I'm going to show you a an epic fail later on here of what I did. Um, but you know, it, you just do your best and don't, don't be afraid of trying. That's all I'm saying. So this is what I'm talking about not being afraid to pair unexpected things together. This IG-8 is over top of TN-7. So I've got a gray over top of a brown. And maybe somebody might say to you, oh, those aren't from the same blending family, but they absolutely are. Just about anything can be blended together when you work them in. You're doing exactly that if you ink blend a background. Let's say you had a hickory smoke background and you wanted to blend it into walnut stain. You'd be blending those two colors together. Now here I am going nuts again with the white gel pen and how to fix that? Make sure your gel pens dry on your work first and then go right over it with the same color of marker. And maybe I'll stop checking out my mugs for where I should put my highlights. That could be where I got the idea of too much. Once I was done the coloring, I checked out my stamp set and grabbed myself a bunch of these really awesome sentiments. There's some great little faces that you can use too, although I didn't use them this trip around. Okay, so here's the technique. You know how everybody's been doing this flicking water on paper lately and then taking the embossing powder, sprinkling it over top and then heat setting it with their heat tool? Well, I haven't entirely mastered the skill of heat setting my embossing powders from beneath, as you can tell by the scorch marks on my paper. But I can assure you that if you do try and set them from the top, the water's going to be sticky enough to hold them in place. And of course, the burns needed some wild hand gestures. Okay, I went ahead and used my uh, Jane Davenport palette here to premix some colors that are going to match the coloring that I used on my elements. And I'm just taking and flicking the wet paintbrush that has the watercolor there onto my Nina Solar White 80 pound paper. Yeah, I use that weight a lot. <laughs> I uh, made sure that I got a lot of clear embossing powder stuck onto this and then I went ahead and, he and heat set it yes from the front a tiny bit blew away but it did pretty well overall 
Now I didn't want to just get stuck with the whole idea of flicking because the flicking's nice and everything like that, but uh, I thought it needed a little bit more than that. So I went ahead and decided to try and see if I do some wet swooshes, whether I could get the embossing powder to stick to that too. And you know what? When I made it thick enough and wet enough, it sure did. And it came up with a really, really cool effect. And that effect also ends up being an emboss resist. So where you've sealed the watercolor underneath your clear embossing powder, that is going to be impervious to other inks and other colorants, let me just say. <laughs> we'll get on to some of that later on in the video. Here I am adding a couple more swooshes and not necessarily so heavy in the water or uh, amount of watercolor. One thing I did notice though is that the heat did change some, some of my watercolor color a little bit. It's not quite as red as it started out, but you know what? It's still pretty pretty. Now I've got one of my scrapbook.com domed um, ink blending heads here, which I have fallen in love with, and I decided to ink blend and then I wanted to do a really quick black edge, and uh, yeah, that's maybe not the way to do it. So then I thought maybe flicking some water on and adding some more gold would help this out a bit, and uh, yeah, not so much. <laughs> then I decided, well, I'll go ahead and heat set it. Maybe it's not going to be so bad. Maybe it'll just be a light haze. That was not the case. <laughs> so this was one that I set aside. Maybe I'll chop it up and make something out of it later. But let's have another go at this. This one I decided to do some good uh, flicking and I went ahead and made sure that I kept the bro brush quite close. It did hit the paper a couple times but I did like the effect that it gave. And it was really, really nice too because it did hang on to that embossing powder quite well. Now here comes a couple really good swooshes and if you're quick when you're doing this, you're gonna catch a great amount of clear embossing powder to hold all of this color underneath so that you can go ahead and do other types of treatments or finishes over top and see how well that sets and no it didn't blow away and I didn't burn this paper. I did decide I wanted some uh, nice gold dots and I thought maybe I should put the water on more thickly but what I found though is that when I put thick dots of water on that it made the actual embossing powder kind of boil and make a bubbly finish which was cool and different but I thought there's got to be a better way moving quickly and having that boiling isn't always what you want but what I did do is add two drops of glycerin to my already wet watercolor mixed it up good and then I could go ahead and put the streaks on and the streaks would be much slower drying and so I could give much finer detail with my watercolor concoction here so glycerin has another use. If you have yourself a refill for your Versamark, you can use a couple drops from that or maybe just even one drop because I think it's already quite thick. But you can see here how it coats and hangs on as though the water is able to stay wet for longer and that's because it is wet for longer. Not bad, eh? So I went ahead and did a couple more finishes and used the trick with the glycerin also with my flicking and when I used a larger brush it gave me a really nice collection of splatters which was quite cool. So it does change how the water hits the paper when you're using the glycerin added to your watercolors. And it might take a little bit of extra time to melt your embossing powders but boy oh boy the finish is well worth it in the end. So this needs just a little bit of extra kind of golding up or jewelry as I like to think of it. Actually it's not gold, I'm going to go with silver. But my point with this one is, although my brush was dirty, I'm using silver powder over top and just like when you use black uh, stamping and you use silver embossing powder over top, you don't need to worry about it. The silver is going to overpower whatever's underneath it. But you can see how nice and thick those splashes are when I use the extra glycerin in with the water. So that's my technique, adding glycerin to the water to make it thicker, using watercolor when you're doing your flicks and embossing, and then using that glycerin to make your watercolor stay wet longer so that you can get the whole job done in the first place. So here's one more trick. You know how you do the Joseph's Technicolor um, finish on your projects? You can go ahead and just use acrylic paint. You can use acrylic artist paint or acrylic 
craft paint, just as long as you water it down, your embossing is going to resist that as well. <laughs> so if you don't like having to ink blend all that black on, go ahead and grab yourself a brush or a sponge and slop your wet paint over top of your embossing. Give it a bit of a wipe and it's going to do exactly the same thing as the Technicolor technique would do otherwise. One other tip, I've added this in a previous video, using that glaze, the micro glaze from Tim Holtz on any of your coloring brings the colors to life and adds absolute depth to your work. You can see on the bottom here the cup that hasn't been glazed, whereas the pot and the top cup has been. And I'm going to add a little bit of glaze to my background too. You'll see the vibrancy in the areas where I have glazed, and then the outside edges get dull where I haven't glazed. Isn't that cool? I did myself a nice foil frame, and I'm going to put a little bit of foam around it. That'll just pop it up nicely and give that kind of galactical coffee background a nice dimension. I also added a really slim uh, black border. I did that with Xyron on the back of a piece of paper and then just cut myself really thin strips. I'm going to do that on an upcoming video. It's a technique I've done in the past and think it's overdue for demonstrating in its own special video. Now I've got a few glue boogers here. They're just ATG that I pull out and uh, roll up so that they fit underneath little tiny pieces that need gluing down. It works just like glue dots, only you already have it right there. Why not use it? I added in some silver hearts that I had left over from my past projects. And then I've also got these little red foil hearts. Now if you want a whole pile of little tiny hearts for your um, projects. The lace heart background die, I'm going to put it up in the corner here, is an absolutely fantastic die to keep you filled out with all the hearts you're ever going to need. So there's a closer look at how my card turned out. You can see how beautiful those images are and how amazingly that background turned out. So here's another one. I just give it a quick inking. Uh, that's with aged linen or antique linen, something like that. Uh, bundled sage and then I went to walnut stain and I just did a really quick job showing you this this is the layout I'm going for I'm adding some strips on the edge of my 5 by 7 card base and then I'm just gonna go ahead and peel the outside edges off this project so that it reveals that um, pearlized kind of coffee colored paper underneath and I added a bunch of ATG so that I could stick this down. I went ahead and used my stamped sentiment and then also layered it with black and some of that nice pearl coffee colored paper and I'm going to put that at the far end and it'll pull together all the colors in um, in my arrangement here. So I'm also moving this up high enough so that that purple shows at the side and the bottom. I've got a heart here that's also from that lace heart background die and I did put some foam on one side and then ATG on the other just to make that have a little bit of moving dimension. Now this is some packing foam. I wanted the cups to have slightly less dimension than the uh, foam tape I added to the back of the sentiment. And I'm just using a little bit of Tombow Mono Multi Glue on the back here. I can finally say that without it being a tongue twister. This glue is great because not only will it stick to the shiny parts of my project, but it's also going to give me a little bit of wiggle room when I set my pieces down to get them aligned exactly right. There's a daisy from the Whimsical Layering Daisy set, and I added a bunch of hearts across the back, including a gold heart that came once again from that 5x7 heart lace background die and I do love that one so here's our last one for today and again I'm just inking it up and this is that antique linen or whatever it's called and basically the same browns again I'm just going ahead and adding kind of you know some grunge to these to really finish off the look you can do whatever you like you don't have to do browns you can add in whatever you want but naturally brown I think lends itself to the whole coffee idea now 
once upon a time in something that I had packed and sent to me, I think it was something to do with pictures. They had put it in, put in this corrugated cardstock and I've saved it for years and years and now I'm finally using it. It's very porous and dry. So I added some liquid glue to the corners to make sure that it doesn't dry the ATG out and come undone from my card base. And then I'm just going to rip an oval out of this piece of work here. And uh, you'll see why in a second. You can see here how much that allows everything to have its opportunity to shine in this project. And again, I've pulled out the Whimsical Layering Daisies. I love those because they've got lots of different sizes. Now there's that chartreuse. This is what I was telling you about before, where I really wanted to kind of spotlight this color. I had this ribbon from a box of wine. It was from the LCBO and if you're in Ontario you know what I'm talking about. And I'm basically taking my scissors and nibbling the outside of this so that it gives a very rustic rough cut. And then I'm going to fray the ribbon so that it has all these little jagged pieces hanging out from the side. And yeah, it's going to make a little mess for me to clean up, but once I get it stuck down to the card, it's going to look so completely cool, it's not even funny. And when I stuck that onto the ribbon, I had already added uh, Tombow Mono Multi to the back of it and let it dry, so it was basically like a thick sticker. So I'm adding again some packing foam to the back of my cups here and I just used ATG to put those on and I also uh, wanted to include some of this gold thread. Why do they make the ends so hard to find on these? Seriously, I end up just grabbing whatever's hanging and yanking because I just get so frustrated I don't care anymore. So here's what I did. A bunch of loops around two fingers, a bunch of loops around three fingers and a couple loops around the pinky pull it off after I've added some glue and then just tuck in any hanging pieces and that makes a fantastic messy nest and that's just going to pull in the gold from the background that we added when we did that water flicking on our paper. So I'm going to add a little Tombow Mono Multi to the back here and that way it'll stick even to the parts that have a lot of embossing Okay, so if you've made it this far, I hope you found lots of tips and learned something new and different. I do hope that you'll try watercolors or even acrylic paints when you do the water technique and use your embossing powders to stretch your supplies a little bit further for something more fun. It would be lovely if you would subscribe to my channel, give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment. If you're interested in checking out Scrappy Tales, I'll leave all the links below. There are affiliate links and it would be lovely if you'd use them because that does help me along on my crafting journey. I do get a small commission from that. And it also lets Sabrina know that I'm doing a good job and that you guys actually like me. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you have some time to craft and have an awesome day. Thanks, bye.